All right, well, good morning, everyone. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and pick up where we left off two weeks ago, and that's in the book of Mark, chapter 9, starting in verse 14. And we'll read down through verse 29. This is an encounter that Jesus had with uh, a father and uh, that had a son that was demon-possessed. And so uh, uh, let's go ahead and read it and then pray and then consider it. So Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 14. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood, and it has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe help my unbelief and when jesus saw that a crowd had came that a crowd came running together he rebuked the unclean spirit saying to it you mutant death spirit i command you come out of him and never enter him again and after crying out and convulsing him terribly it came out and the boy was like a corpse so that most of them said he's dead but jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose and when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Well, let's pray. Father, again, as we open up your word, we are so grateful that it is written down as it is, as it has been inspired by the Spirit. Uh, I pray that as we study it and learn from it as uh, as the apostles and the disciples were learning during all these episodes and these uh, engagements that Christ had with, with people, I pray that we can learn from it as well. Uh, thank you for preserving it for all this time. May it, uh, may it just enter our hearts and we learn from it. In your son's name, amen. All right, so entitle this, Belief versus Unbelief, Faith versus Doubt, Okay. Uh, so let's put it in context. As we, a couple of weeks ago, as you recall, coming immediately before this, um, uh, I guess, engagement with uh, the father of the demon-possessed son, uh, the disciples had been up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, they had seen his glory. Uh, they, again, as you recall, the disciples, they had this idea that that glory was going to come soon and it was going to be an earthly glory. He was going to have an earthly kingdom right then. So they come down from that mountain. They're pretty fired up about telling everyone. But Jesus says, no, you don't tell anybody what you just saw. Not until I arise from the dead. And they kept talking among themselves what this raising from the dead has to do with Jesus. So they, they didn't quite understand. Um, but that was kind of what happens right before this. And for two years, though, prior to this, think about this. The disciples, they they've walked with Jesus. They've walked by sight, okay? We know that we uh, have been told that we walk by faith, not by sight, but they had the privilege of walking by sight and seeing everything that, that Jesus did. He heard everything he taught. They were privileged to explanations of those teachings as well. Um, they saw how he engaged people. He saw the miracles. They saw his power, okay? But soon Jesus was going to be gone, and then they were going to have to walk by faith. So this is a lesson uh, on faith. Now, everything that Jesus had taught them would be 
brought back to their recollection by the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and they would remember it, and they would write it down for us, and we would have the Word of God. But as you recall, the, the, the apostles and the disciples were slow. Uh, they didn't get it. They didn't understand things. They were often rebuked by Jesus for lack of faith and lack of understanding. Um, but as Jesus moved then from the last two years of his ministry, where he's among the crowds and, and doing his miracles, now he's moving towards Jerusalem and the cross. And he's taking this last year, primarily all these teachings that we are encountering in Mark over the next few uh, weeks are primarily teaching his disciples because he'll soon be gone. So there are many things they needed to learn. Um, they learned uh, coming up over the next few weeks, he's going to have a, uh, a lesson on humility. You remember the disciples would on the road from this event to Capernaum, they were discussing which of them was the greatest. He needed a little lesson on that. He would teach them on offenses. He teaches them, and he would teach them uh, on the seriousness of sin. Uh, he'd teach them on divorce. He'd teach them on children in the kingdom. He'd teach them on the difference between earthly riches and true wealth. And then he, he will, will follow up before, um, uh, at the very end, with another lesson on faith. But this is, a, this is a lesson that he is teaching his disciples on faith. This miracle uh, that he performs here with the, driving the demon out connects healing with faith. Now, Christ healed many. Um, it did not matter if they had faith or not. He healed some that had faith, some that he told them they had faith. Uh, the faith was not a necessary prerequisite to their healing by any means. Um, but in this particular episode, he connects the two. And we'll see kind of why as, we, as, we, as it kind of unfolds and we go through it. Um, again, like I said, Jesus never shied away from, from uh, rebuking his disciples when necessary. Many times he spoke to them that said that they had little faith. Uh, he spoke to them they didn't have the understanding, uh, uh, all those things. And so this particular event, this particular um, uh, healing uh, is also recorded in Matthew 17, 14 through 20, and Luke 9, uh, 37 through 45. But Mark gives more details of it than any of those. So we're, let's, let's go on there. Again, like I said, this comes right on the tails of the disciples coming down from the uh, mountaintop experience, the transfiguration, um, and, and, and Christ answering that question about Elijah that John the Baptist uh, was the Elijah to come, uh, you know, kind of because they are asking, well, don't the scribes say that Elijah is supposed to come first? And Elijah hadn't physically come and they hadn't seen him, so Jesus talked to him about that. But now he returns from the mountain and he comes down and uh, in verse 14 it says, and when they came to the disciples, okay, they meaning Jesus, Peter, John, and James, when they came down from the mountain, they saw a great crowd around them and the scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up and greeted him. So Jesus comes down with uh, Peter, James, and John uh, from the mountain, and it's not good. There's arguing going on down there. I mean, it's kind of like when Moses comes down from the mountain, things weren't good, right? I mean, this golden calf just kind of formed itself out of the gold that they threw in the fire, and they were worshiping it. But kind of like that, Moses was gone 40 days and 40 nights. Now, we don't know how long Jesus was up on a mountain, but it seemed to be a much shorter time than that. But nonetheless, uh, uh, disarray was happening down there. Scribes were arguing with his disciples, okay? Scribes. Scribes were always trying to discredit Jesus. They were always trying to... Uh, discredit the disciples who were a representative of Jesus, obviously. Um, scribes, you know, they had already made their mind up that, that the things Jesus was doing, he was doing by the power of Satan. But the disciples were down there arguing back, and because they had failed miserably, it's something that they had done before. So when he comes down, you know, it's, it said they're arguing, Jesus sees them arguing. He had the crowd. Uh, and the crowd, as a crowd always does, they're always greatly amazed to see Jesus. 
Now, some commentators will say that because this comes on the heels of him coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration and, and he still had some glory shining on his face and so they were all amazed at that, but that doesn't really make sense because he told us, you know, don't tell anybody what you just saw, so why would he have that there? Now, I think most of the time that when, when Jesus showed up, his reputation was such that people were just amazed at him and they greeted him. And, and in, um, in some of the other translations, it says they saluted him. And some of them say they congratulated him. Uh, but nonetheless, they welcomed him and they were, gl they were glad to see him. Then in verse 16, Jesus asked them, which would be, I guess, everyone that could hear him, what are you arguing about with them? Actually, I guess he's probably asking his disciples. So what are you arguing about with them? And you notice who answers. The scribes don't answer, okay? The disciples don't answer, okay? They're a little embarrassed as well. But someone from the crowd answers. And that someone from the crowd is the father of this son that has a demon possession. In verse 17, it says, uh, and someone from the crowd answers, a teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And then whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth, becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. So here's the problem. Here's the problem that's presented for him. Problem of demon possession. The father has determined correctly that his son has a demon. Now other people might just look at this son and say, well, he's got a mental illness, or he's... He's just crazy, or he's an epileptic, things like that that we would say. But we know down in verse 22 where he says that this spirit, this, this um, uh, demon that's inside him is always trying to kill him. It's throwing him down in the fire, into the water. It's always trying to end his life. Um, but he was unable to. The child's still alive, okay, still present. And so he asks, you know, this demon who would be certainly much stronger than the child, why was he unable to to do that? Why was he unable to, uh, to kill him? Well, probably like the blind man in John chapter 9, verse 3. He was blind since birth. Uh, I think I wrote that down there. Yeah, but it was for the purpose of uh, this blind man wasn't blind because he had sinned or anything. This young man wasn't had this demon possession because he was sinful or anything. Uh, but it's so the glory of God might be manifest in him. It was for this purpose that uh, this boy was here at this particular time. So this boy is possessed by a demon, and the disciples couldn't cast it out. Okay, which is really surprising because uh, we know earlier that Jesus had given them the authority over unclean spirits. When he, he sent them out two by two in John chapter 6, verses 7 and 13 there, it says he gave them the power to over unclean spirits. And then in verse 13 it says, and they, they uh, um, cast out many unclean spirits. So they had the power, Jesus had given them the power to do that, so kind of what's going on here? Well, let's keep reading. Verse 19 then, uh, as we go, this is Jesus' rebuke, command, and the demon response. So in verse 19, he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? So the question is, who is he speaking to here? Who is this faithless generation? Is he speaking to the scribes? Because they certainly were faithless, weren't they? They, were, they certainly didn't have any faith in Christ. They thought he was of Satan. Was he speaking to his disciples because they couldn't cast out that demon? Was he speaking to the Father? Okay, because he, as you recall, he says, if you can, he had some lack of faith there as well. It may just be all of the above that he's speaking to, um, because we're all kind of in that general category. We have, even believers have faith, but like the Father here, we must pray for more faith. We must pray for that, because there is certain unbelief, there's certain doubt that creeps into everything that we have. Uh, so he's speaking probably to, uh, to all the above uh, about this. But then he says at the end of that, bring him to me. He says to the father, bring him to me. Okay, the father has his child with this terrible condition, uh, the demon possession. Certainly that it had been happening since childhood, so it had been happening quite a long time. Certainly that would bring much grief and pain and hardship on the father. 
Um, and, but Jesus says, bring him to me. Now we all, many of us in here have children, and um, we understand that, that a child's a precious gift from God, but it can also come with much trouble and much anxiety, um, great joy, great heartache. That's what children are about. We can have a child that's, that's filled with the Holy Spirit and, and doing great, and we just praise God for that, or he can be possessed with the spirit of evil. But either way, we must always bring him to Jesus. Bring him to Jesus in word, in, in the word of God, in prayer, agonizing prayer a lot of times because it's our, it's our own children that we're, that we're uh, praying about. And we pray, we do this, we bring him to him even before that child is born. You know, we must bring him to Jesus. As he grows up and he's under our care, we should certainly bring him to Jesus in prayer. And then when he grows up and he enters the world and we have essentially no control over him, and some may go wayward, and some may, some may not, we bring them to Jesus in prayer. That's, that's a command of Jesus, because there's no, there's no ill, there's nothing that can overcome uh, one of our children um, that can't be overcome by the power of Jesus. So we continue to bring our children in prayer. So here we have this grief-stricken father brought in his demon-possessed son, and Jesus commands him to bring him to him, right? So in verse um, 20, the, the, the response then, um, verse 20 is, and they brought the boy to him, okay? And when the Spirit saw him, in other words, when the Spirit in the boy saw Jesus, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell to the ground, rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Okay, so this, when the Spirit saw Jesus, he did what demons do in the, in the New Testament. We've read this on more occasions than one. When Jesus first entered the synagogue there, at the beginning of his ministry, there was a, uh, a man with a demon inside him. And immediately that demon recognized Jesus and cried out. Uh, and the same thing happened when he came out. He, he threw himself down and, and convulsed. But the point is these demons... They recognize who Jesus is. They always recognize who Jesus was. They, they, they knew him from the time they were created. Uh, but many of the people don't recognize who Jesus is. The demons always recognize, and they're terrified of him because they're wondering, my time short, this is the end. They, they know who Jesus is. So, so that, is, um, that is something that we see now always in the New Testament. Demons know who Jesus is. People's do not understand, or many people do not see who Jesus is. And then uh, at the end, um, <clears> there <throat> in verse 21, um, he says, and Jesus asked the Father again, how long has this been happening to him? How long? Why does Jesus ask questions? I mean, doesn't he know the answer already? He does, okay? I mean, we know he's omniscient. He knows everything. But nonetheless, he asked many questions in the New Testament. And just like he, he asked, um, remember when he asked his disciples, you know, who do people say I am? And they say, well, you know, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're one of the other prophets. Uh, uh, but they said, well, and who do you say I am? Again, Jesus knows the answer, right? But he's getting Peter, and Peter confesses then you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus then reminds him that that was revealed to him by God. He didn't just figure that out because he's smarter than the rest of them. That was something real revealed by God. And again, uh, another thing, in, in, uh, just in a couple of verses, actually next week when um, we discuss who is the greatest, uh, the same thing happens. The disciples are coming from this event, walking down to Capernaum, discussing among themselves who's the greatest. They get there to Capernaum, and Jesus <clears throat> turns and asks them, what were y'all discussing on the way? You know, they, they didn't answer them. They were a little bit embarrassed about that. But he asked questions. Certainly he knows the answer. He's not seeking information by any means. <clears throat> but he asked his father the question, how long has this been going on? Well, I think the answer that the father gives him reveals that this has been a long drawn out affliction, very difficult, the hopelessness of the affliction. I'm sure he had, his father had prayed for this child on numerous occasions, probably taken him to many 
doctors and physicians on many occasions. This has been long standing and in a final uh, gasp, he takes them to the disciples because he hears of this Jesus. And then they can't do anything for him. So he's in this hopeless position, but, but Jesus now reveals to him that he is, he's coming to the, the son of God who does have the power to heal him, okay? And, um, and he's not coming to just some impersonal entity or impersonal machine uh, to heal him. Um, you know, that's the, it's, it shows the compassion of Christ uh, in the Father and demonstrating his compassion in this, in this miracle. And so he says from childhood, and he says often it casts him in the fire and water to destroy him. Again, the, the, the demon was always trying to uh, really terminate the life of this boy. But then the father says this, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. That's a very interesting uh, plea from the father there. Um, remember the leper uh, came up to Jesus and says, I know you can, but if you will, you can make me clean. So he didn't by any chance, he didn't uh, doubt the power of Jesus in any way. The leper did not, but this father is kind of doubting the power of Jesus, if you can. But he comes in uh, total submission. He goes, if you can, have compassion on us and help us. He ha have mercy on me. He's got nothing to offer. You know, he's, he's just like we are as sinners. We've got nothing to offer when, when we come to Christ and um, uh, like the tax collector, have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. I've got nothing to, that'll do, but you have mercy on me, please. So he's got, this father has a little bit of doubt going on because the disciples who are reflections of Christ supposed to be, okay, aren't we supposed to be reflections of Christ in what we do? Well, these disciples who are uh, reflections of Christ couldn't do it. So that reflects somewhat on Christ, okay? So now he's thinking, you know, well, if they can't do it, you know, maybe you can, if you can, okay? But the point is here that, that as disciples of Christ, we, everything we do reflects on Christ, okay? So when we can't hold our tongue, you know, when we do bad things, when we can't show self-control, when we give in to temptations, it, it reflects on Christ. I mean, other people will see that and say, you know, Christ doesn't have much power over that. You, it doesn't do anything for you. Um, but, but we have to remember that. But this, this father here, again, he, he's desperate. He comes in mercy. And then Jesus says to him, in somewhat challenging the faith that the fathers demonstrate, some, some kind of rebuking him uh, by saying uh, this in, uh, in the ESV. Um, uh, it says, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Now, when I first read that in the ESV, I read, if you can, like he's kind of indignant, like you would doubt that I, I'm Jesus. You know, I, I can do anything. You read that in ESV, but that's not how it's, how it's written at all. So that's why it's good to kind of read other translations because in my mind, when I read things, some things come out. You may have gotten that right away when you read that, but King James kind of says it a little more plainly. Um, he says, if you can't believe, all things are possible to him that believe it. So if thou canst believe, okay, all things are possible. So if you, if you have faith, all things are possible. Okay, it doesn't mean you get everything you want, but if you have faith, this is what you understand. You understand that that faith was granted to you by an all-powerful God. Okay, and if you understand that and you know this is an all-powerful God you have put your faith in, that all-powerful all God can do anything. Right? I mean, that's almighty, all-powerful. He, all, he can do everything. Omnipotent, I guess, is a fancier word that some people use. Uh, but that's what we understand it to be. He's, he's saying to the, um, to the Father um, that, yes, if you have faith, all things are possible. And then the Father responds immediately after that. 
Uh, I believe, help my unbelief. So it, it's, it's, it's like this with all of us. We, we have faith that is granted to us by the Lord, right? And we uh, have, uh, and everyone has a different level of faith, okay? God grants enough faith to you uh, for the purposes for which he wants you. I guess that's the best way of saying it. You see people that have great faith, that, you, that exhibit great faith. Uh, you see people that you can't even tell they have faith, right? There's all levels, but what faith they have, if it is the faith that is granted to them by God, it's sufficient for the purpose for which God sent it, for the purpose of God's. Now, we have the remaining flesh, and the remaining flesh in us casts doubt on that faith. That's kind of what it does. But all true believers will understand that that almighty God that you have your faith in, if it's in his will and it seems impossible to us, it's not impossible to God. We have that faith. We all understand that. If we're a true believer in here, we understand that. Um, in Mark uh, yeah, 10, 27, it's like when uh, Jesus told the parable about when the... Uh, that it's, it's, it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. And in the Jewish uh, thought at that time, the riches were the ones that were, uh, they were, God loved them more because he gave them the riches. Okay, that was their idea. So, so they say all these rich people who, who God loves, it's going to be, they can't get into the kingdom of heaven because I know a camel can't go through an eye of a needle, so, so then, well, who can be saved? And so Jesus tells them, with man, it is impossible. Okay. With man, it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. So it's the power of God that, that is what we are accessed through uh, the faith. The power of God, almighty, unlimited God, omnipotent God. Um, you know, he took, he took a wretched sinner that it was at enmity with God, that hated God, and he made him one of his children for all eternity. Okay. He takes someone that seeks worldly pleasure, that just loves the world and hates God and is a slave of sin, and he makes him a slave of righteousness. Okay. That's the power of God we're talking about here. And when, when that is placed in us, we understand that nothing is impossible. Okay. So he says, I believe, help my unbelief. He, he's, he's asking for more faith. He's asking for more faith, which is something we should ask for all the time. Because we have, our faith is always mixed in with a little bit of doubt. Uh, again, we know this faith is a gift from God. It's nothing we did to earn it. And we may not demonstrate it as perfect faith. As a matter of fact, we never demonstrate it as perfect faith on this earth. Uh, but like I said, it is sufficient faith for what it was granted to us for. Um, and it's not perfect because it's mixed in again with the um, remaining sin. So you can see this father, certainly life had beaten him down. He's had this son that was uh, difficult to say the least for, for a number of years since childhood. And what the, the father then is, is kind of crying out something like this, uh, you know, I believe in your power and compassion, you know, but I kind of fail to rely on it all the times and everything. And I fail to rely that understanding that all things are possible. And so, so this doubt creeps in. So he's asking for more grace to give him more faith. That's what we should do. We all have that doubt. I mean, faith is mixed with doubt as well. So, so we, need to, we need to pray that same prayer. Uh, to rely on that grace because he will freely give it to us. So, all, again, all, um, <clears throat> we're all given that certain amount of faith, but we all tend not to rely on it like we should. Uh, so we must pray for more. So let's move on. In verse 25, then, uh, Jesus saw that the people were gathering, a crowd was running together, and remember Jesus, at this point, he's not wanting to really be engaged with the crowd. This is a time he's using to teach his disciples. So the crowd's running together. So he go ahead and rebukes the spirit, says, you mutant deaf spirit, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. Never enter him again. 
And after crying and convulsing terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse, so most of them said, he's dead. So the people were gathering, um, doesn't want to uh, gather attention. The, the demon comes out with one final act as, a, as a, an attempt to kill the child, as he did, uh, as demons do in the New Testament. But Jesus tells him, never enter him again. Okay, he doesn't say that always when he drives out demons, but he said it here. Um, and, you know, he's given us a warning about demons when they leave, that sometimes they, they, when they leave a person, they leave that house clean, and uh, if something else doesn't kind of occupy that house, he'll go out and get a few more demons and come back, and then it's going to be worse than it was when he started. But he told this demon, you don't come back. This, this, son, this guy is healed. Matthew said he used the word he's healed instantly. So then... Um, so then Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. Okay, let's go on to the final, the, the prideful disciples and the power of prayer. The last one on your little hand out there. The power of prayer, okay? The, and when they entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to him, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Hmm. So why not? They had, again, as we know, they had driven out demons before, okay? They had had some, uh, some successes doing that, I guess you would say that, okay? Um, when it says this kind cannot be driven out, that, that word kind could refer to a certain kind of demon that maybe was more difficult than another, or it could just refer to demons in general, this kind, demons, they require prayer, okay? Matthew Henry seemed to think the demons that, that were long-standing and in really entrenched in a, in a person might be more difficult, maybe too difficult for the disciples, but, you know, it's not too difficult for Christ, right? They have to obey Christ, okay? Um, I don't know the answer to that question, but, but let's, let's move on. But the implication here is that when he says at the end, this kind, uh, if it's referring to all demons, cannot be driven out by anything but prayer, uh, the implication is that the disciples didn't pray. They didn't, when they, they maybe had some successes and they got a little bit of too much of faith in, them own, in their own self and their own power. Um, you know, again, remember their, their expectations were, their messianic expectations, Christ is, is here, he's the Messiah, we, we get that. He's still, they're still thinking he's going to set up shop now, and we're going to be right there with them. We're going to be right on top with them. So they've kind of got a little bit of a pride issue. Uh, and as I said in the next thing, they're arguing on their way who's the greatest. So they got this pride issue. We have to understand this. So due to, you put a little bit of success in someone who's got a pride issue, and that just makes that pride issue that much more, right? Um, so they failed to see and Christ will tell they failed to see that they must always rely on God. This is a good lesson for the disciples. They failed to see, they tried to do it on their own, is what it seems like is happening here. And so they failed to see that they needed to, to bring it to God in prayer. Because prayer is that conduit, conduit I guess the word, by where we access God's power. Right? We, we pray to him, we talk to him, we, we bring it to him, we ask him. So that's the channel uh, of power. And the disciples failed to have, seemed to have forgotten that and took a little bit of faith in themselves. And certainly in sinful, prideful men, that's, that's something that we see happens a lot. Now Matthew, in his, uh, uh, in his parallel passage, makes sure we understand that it's not the amount of faith you have that is the issue here. Okay, in other words, you can only drive that demon out if you have great faith, okay? No, he says in his, when he talks about the mustard seed, I think I put it on there, yeah, at the bottom, you know, even someone who's got this faith that's just a little bitty mustard seed, the smallest seed that was known to them at that time, can move mountains, okay? So, so even with this little faith, but you have to access that faith, you have to to pray for that faith. You have to, to, to ask God for that faith and understand that if he, grants, if he grants 
what you're asking him to, it's his power that did it, not your power, not your power. And that seems to be the disciples were kind of learning that still. They were kind of learning that still. So they were prideful. They didn't, they seemed to, they didn't humbly turn to God when they were uh, trying to help this demon-possessed man. Um, uh, they relied somewhat on themselves. So it's really a lesson this whole thing is really a lesson in faith, faith to the disciples, okay, faith of the Father, our faith. That's why these things are written down so that we get it as well, okay, written down by the Holy Spirit. So the disciples, again, like I said, they had that privilege for, the, for at least for three years total, but for the two years prior to this, they walked by side, saw everything that Christ did, uh, but once he's gone, they're going to have to walk by faith. So they need to have this lesson in faith. They need to have this lesson. And not a faith in themselves, a prideful faith, but, but a God-given faith in an almighty God that can do the impossible. That's what they need to understand. Um, so we walk by faith today, right? We walk by faith, not by sight. That's in 2 Corinthians, right? Um, we have faith in a God that we can't see. We have faith in Jesus who we've never seen, right? Um, we have a faith in the Holy Spirit that we can't see. Okay. We have faith in the crucifixion that we didn't witness or in the resurrection that we never saw. So is that blind faith? No, not at all. It's given to us in the Word. The Word, inspired by the Holy Spirit, but written down by men. The faith that, that is written down exactly who Jesus is and who we are. But we live in a fallen world. Afflictions, difficulties, trials, like the Father, will always, they're inevitable. And they're always going to shed some doubt on what faith that we have been given, right? And then you put into there that our sinful pride. Okay, you throw that in there, and that's going to say, well, I can do it on my own. I don't need to rely on him, right? No, you know, in a this thing in our own power, that, that, that just keeps us from relying on God's power. So, so like the father was crying out, and the father had a little bit of faith, because think of this. If he wouldn't ask for helping my unbelief or, or help give me more faith. I believe help my unbelief. He's got that little bit of faith that now he acknowledges he doesn't have all of it. You need to help me with it. If he didn't have any faith at all, he wouldn't know he didn't have it. Right? So we know he's got a little bit. He wants more. And we have to pray to God for that. Um, so we must wholly rely on God because he is the power behind our faith. Uh, and so asking for more faith more believing, relying on that power, not on our own uh, sinful. We just ask God that he can grant that to us each and every day. All right, so that's, uh, that's it. All right, let's pray. Have a little time of fellowship and listen to Gabriel uh, bring the word. Father, we thank you again so much for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the faith that you've given us, dear Lord. And and we just ask you for more and more of that. We ask you that you would take away our selfish pride that, that says we can do things on our own and just grant us the, the faith that relies on your power, dear Lord. Uh, may we just pray for this each and every day. We ask this in your son's name. Amen.